Uh, so welcome everyone um, to the introduction to break, uh, uh, breakout session tackling climate change at user uh, 2000, 2020. I am uh, very excited that we have this session and I am totally surprised uh, how many people uh, showed up. Uh, my name is Olga Mishvasulima and I'm uh, the session organizer. I'm also a data uh, scientist, but today my role is a session organizer. Um, and I am organizing um, the session because I hope to uh, increase awareness uh, about the issue of climate change and especially how press pressing it is. Uh, I hope also that uh, we can uh, showcase uh, data science solutions and provide uh, inspiration for the community. And the most important part, in my opinion, is to offer networking uh, between uh, tech people, our developers, and the uh, scientific uh, community, because uh, I believe there is a gap over there. Uh, so let's close it. So why are we even uh, talking about climate change at an our uh, conference i would like to uh, give some context first so we are currently emitting 33 gigatons of co2 every year and to limit global warming below 1.5 uh, uh, degrees uh, we need a massive decarbonization at a scale 10% uh, uh, a year. And uh, this means the commissioning current infrastructure, uh, which is obviously not happening. So is there anything I could do to help? Obviously, uh, machine learning and uh, data science won't solve uh, climate change but uh, can help in mitigation and adaptation. And some use cases that uh, were it already proved to be successful is for example, uh, forecasting electricity supply and demand to uh, maximize, to, to design smarter electricity grids to maximize the use of renewables by uh, also in reducing deforestation, by analyzing satellite images or using analyzing uh, noise. Um, and I think the area that is a little bit overlooked, but also in uh, building educational materials, um, uh, tools that can be used to educate the public. And one of the great examples is the uh, uh, census platform uh, which uh, combines uh, data visualization and uh, storytelling uh, to build uh, climate change uh, scenarios. Um, I highly encourage you to check out the Tackling Climate Change with uh, Machine Learning uh, paper, where authors in 13 chap chapters uh, discuss uh, potential applications. So what we have planned uh, for today, um, I would like to highlight uh, contribution, other uh, climate related contributions that were uh, submitted uh, to USAR this year. Uh, then we will have a presentation uh, from uh, Philip Stahura, how to join AI for Good Movement, uh, where he will share the lesson learned from uh, starting AI for Good uh, projects. Uh, Next, uh, we will uh, have Martin Diderski uh, talking about how data scientists can help in uh, climate studies from his experience in working uh, with environmental projects. And um, after we finish with the presentations, uh, we will have an online discussion and the presentation part is scheduled for around uh, uh, 45 minutes. We will uh, allow for, uh, for questions after each presentation. We will, uh, there is a uh, dedicated, since we have uh, many participants, we will, um, there is an application and uh, Heidi will explain in a second uh, 
how it works. So you can ask the question in the app and upvote uh, uh, the question. And we will, uh, depending on, on how many questions there, there are, uh, but we might only ask the, uh, the questions that uh, got the most uh, votes. And the next uh, 45 minutes, we will have uh, an online uh, discussion. So Heidi, maybe you can just briefly uh, mention the application for asking questions. Sure. Um, hi, everyone from my side as well. I'm one of the organizers of this year's R user conference. Um, you can find the link to the question app in the chat. To go to the chat, go to the bottom of Zoom. There you find a button that says chat. And there you can find the link uh, to Slido, which is the app we'll be using for questions. Also, um, please feel free to turn on captions. We have a captioner here today. And if, if you need captions for any reason, um, you can turn it on by going to the bottom of Zoom and there is a button that says closed caption. And if, you, if that is green, then you're, you will see captions at the bottom of Zoom, which might help you understand the session better. Um, I think that's everything I needed to say for the technical part. Okay. Thanks, Olga. Thank you. So now let me move to highlighting uh, the other contributions. So I highly encourage you to uh, check out um, uh, Fast AI in R, Preserving Wildlife with uh, Computer Vision. How green is your portfolio tracking CO2 footprint in insurance uh, sector and social Specializing the pixels, especially explicit discrete choice modeling of land cover change in Europe from 2000 to 2018. Uh, this should be available on a conference YouTube channel. Uh, I know that uh, at least uh, we have uh, here today uh, Jenze, who is an author of uh, Fast AI in R. So there for sure will be a chance to uh, to chat to uh, Yenjay during the discussion, and uh, if other authors are here as well, uh, please introduce yourself uh, during uh, the discussion. Mm. So I would like to end uh, the introduction with a short uh, call to action. Uh, find an application for your uh, technical skills. Uh, cooperate with experts and scientists. They usually need technical skills uh, like uh, yours to move forward with their ideas and uh, start now as we are uh, running out of time. And uh, before I give the uh, voice to Philip, there is uh, one more thing that actually I should have mentioned at the beginning. Uh, but if the, we are recording the session and if you wish not to uh, appear on the screen, uh, you can just turn off your uh, camera and also uh, we, will, we can hide your name. Uh, so this is my short announcement. Thank you. And now I uh, give uh, the screen to Philip. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Very excited uh, that we have that many people on this session. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Let me make sure. Yeah, notifications are off. All good. And here we go. Let's a little more space. Okay, so uh, very excited to speak at USAR. Uh, to be completely honest, I'm just a replacement. Uh, Tadek, our AI for Good leader, uh, was supposed to deliver this presentation, uh, but I am highly involved in uh, our work and projects, so uh, I hope I am going to explain this, uh, our story with uh, uh, ML and data science support and contributions, and also answer your questions. Uh, we also have Yenjay here, uh, who is going to answer the questions uh, with me. 
I am the CEO uh, of Upsilon. Uh, we are a commercial company uh, with, uh, I think, non-obvious purpose. Uh, and our core purpose is to preserve and improve human life through technology. We are a group of uh, engineers, uh, software developers, machine learning engineers uh, that feel that we can make a greater impact and that we are actually responsible to try uh, to contribute. Uh, we recognize that we are not going to make this change uh, on our own, of course. Uh, and uh, it was, it became quite obvious for us at the late 2018 uh, that we uh, should not only contribute uh, to open source uh, and not only be part of the uh, R and, and, and software community, not only speak at the conferences and share our experience and knowledge, but also actively uh, invest uh, to try to make a difference and to contribute. As a group, we've decided that climate change and uh, environment is the problem we want to focus on because we feel that this is the, uh, the place we can have uh, the, the most impact in. Uh, and second to that, we also are uh, the most afraid of those changes. Uh, Meet 2019, we hired uh, our own internal AI for good leader, Tadek. Uh, and we uh, contribute with uh, pro bono work for projects that are best aligned with our purpose and with our, uh, our core competencies, uh, but also help other uh, with uh, reduced rates. And we try to uh, get uh, and secure grants uh, to contribute even more. Uh, one uh, non-obvious um, effect of that change as an organization is that we actually increased portfolio of commercial projects that are better aligned with uh, our purpose. And that also influenced uh, some our decisions in other areas uh, of our company uh, and also our projects. Uh, Uh, and now just several lessons uh, from our experience. Uh, we uh, made some mistakes and I want to share what, in our opinion, what, what worked for us uh, in the end, uh, because it might be useful to you as well. So first is uh, to uh, try not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, this seems obvious now, but uh, it's easy as a as an engineer or a technologist uh, to think about uh, the new clever way to do something. It's much better actually to speak with people uh, that already work on those problems. Uh, they will tell you uh, what didn't work for them and what uh, they have tried. Uh, the second advice is to uh, try to identify the gaps that are closing now. Uh, try to contribute with your core competencies uh, and try to address problems that were very hard uh, several years ago, uh, but now due to uh, technological progress get, uh, just got easier uh, or easy. Uh, keep iterations small. Uh, this is important because you are going to learn along the way, but uh, this is also important because you are going to share your results. And this is important for the fourth point. Uh, so when you are going to share your results, you are going to be able to network with more people, get to know people from other organizations, and make yourself uh, easy to find. Um, fifth lesson is to own the work. For the first half of 2019, we struggled. We had uh, spikes of intense work. Uh, on uh, AI for good, uh, but then we uh, got busy with commercial work uh, to, to have another spike uh, once Tadek joined. And Tadek had completely different experience than us. Uh, he actually worked on the ground. Uh, he worked with NGOs, he worked with government ad administration. He actually spent time in rainfo rainforests and in Africa. Uh, so he shared a lot of different experience and perspective with us, 
and uh, he was committed to make regular continuous progress in this area. And that was uh, very important. Uh, and this uh, actually uh, made a huge difference. Uh, and six is to secure the work. Uh, so what I mean by here, uh, by this is to secure the funding. So uh, time of engineers, our time uh, is expensive. And uh, uh, also we have uh, limited resources. So uh, in our case, we decided to just pledge a significant amount of our income and, and, and profit uh, to fuel this uh, mission and, and uh, those engagements. Uh, the other way is to try to secure uh, grants, uh, but uh, keep in mind that the comp competition is uh, extremely hard. Uh, so you, you might need to look for alternatives as well. Mm, and we, uh, since we started, we've identified two main personas uh, here, and I, I want to give some advice uh, to, uh, to both uh, of them. So one is uh, engineering uh, developer, machine learning persona, someone from the tech community. So first is to first advice is to uh, network, network, network. So this is what also what uh, Olga uh, has mentioned. Uh, get to know people from uh, administration, from academia, uh, working within different NGOs uh, on other continents as well, uh, and then listen to them. Uh, ask uh, about their experience. Ask uh, what's hard about those stuff that they. Uh, do what they have tried. Uh, educate them of what, what is possible and what's not. I think it's very important to uh, say what's uh, difficult or impossible uh, with uh, technology and then offer and, uh, and only then offer uh, the support. And for the sustainability community, uh, I think it is important to explore uh, existing applications in your field uh, and also in similar domains of how data science, how machine learning proved to be useful already. Uh, then uh, also get to know uh, people from the US, from, from the tech community, go maybe to a tech conference. Uh, and uh, also very important, request support, uh, ask for help, ask for explanation of, uh, of some Think you, uh, you, you of some thing, some solution that you think can work. Be also a trigger for many people on the other side to actually get involved. Uh, th this kind of uh, request can be uh, highly beneficial, and uh, I, I think many people are going to help you. Uh, and. Uh, uh, last advice here is to, and, and this is advice for both sides actually, is to clearly define uh, the needs. Um, because if uh, you are not going to do this right, you are going to deliver possibly only part uh, of the solution. And uh, even if this part is going to bring some progress, it might not bring any uh, impact. And impact is what we aim for. Uh, so. A uh, model itself is not going to help if it's not useful, if it's not driving some decisions, uh, it, if it's not helping decision makers. So the, the, the project needs to be uh, complete. Uh, during this time, uh, we also engaged with uh, different organizations uh, and, and we uh, strongly encourage to do that as well. Uh, these are some examples here. Uh, you can get to know other people that also care and actively work on those problems. You can team up as well. Uh, so go to those websites, uh, try to get involved, get to know people. Uh, and now some uh, of our uh, project case studies. Uh, everything is... Uh, uh, nice in theory, uh, but uh, I think uh, learning about uh, projects that uh, are happening or happened uh, might uh, 
make this uh, discussion more useful to all of us. So uh, here's uh, one project where we uh, use uh, two of our uh, competencies. One is deep learning model. And this uh, deep learning model was delivered in Python. Uh, and uh, the other one is uh, decision support systems with, uh, with Shiny. So we've embedded the, uh, the model to identify uh, buildings and then classify uh, post-disaster uh, damages to those uh, buildings so that uh, people can, within 12 or 24 hours, uh, whenever new satellite image is available, identify uh, the, uh, the damage, uh, for example, after the flood or hurricane or other natural disaster. Uh, so this uh, is able to help people to direct help to the right places uh, and uh, act uh, much faster without the need to uh, work on the ground. And here, a similar project with help uh, IASA uh, organization, a productionize tool to help decision makers uh, direct uh, funds after natural disasters in Madagascar, so that uh, people can distribute resources that they have to the right places. And, and, and we think that uh, this type of tools are going to be more and more important. So helping decision makers make better decisions uh, also in the public administration. Uh, another project uh, involving uh, those two uh, core competencies, one uh, is another computer vision uh, work. So here you can see a computer vision model identifying wildlife animals uh, on the images, uh, photos from camera traps. So uh, these images are from uh, uh, natural parks in Gabon. And this project is collaboration with the uh, University of Stirling with uh, researchers uh, from the university. And uh, without computer vision, they have just vast amount of data uh, that requires uh, manual work, uh, but that's a lot of manual work. So most of those images are not used at all. Uh, with computer vision, this is uh, automated. Uh, so we simplify uh, that work, but we also improve the results because as you see, those models are able to uh, identify animals uh, during the night. So we, we have night vision. Uh, so, so we also get uh, more reliable results uh, that we can trust. Uh, but uh, this types of uh, this project is an example of uh, something that would not be useful if it's just a model. Uh, we actually had a, to build a tool for uh, people in in Gabon uh, to work without internet connection. So we've embedded the machine learning deep learning model with an Electron app uh, so, so that they can use it on Windows and they use fast AI model on Windows uh, hardware, uh, on Windows with legacy hard hardware without internet connection. Uh, and they can detect animals, but they can also explore and uh, make insights based on th those uh, classification results. Uh, and they can learn what kind of species were identified, how many, uh, how big is the population, and also what is important, how many rare species uh, were identified. Uh, so these types of insights are crucial to uh, secure uh, biodiversity in this region. And, and we hope that after this project is going to be successful here, we can also uh, implement this solution in other regions as well. Uh, and last uh, recent example, uh, so we've been all uh, influenced uh, uh, by, by COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, this is the tool uh, from Epicentra, uh, their, their COVID dashboard. This is uh, a shiny dashboard built in R, uh, but without uh, optimization, this dashboard was very, very slow. 
So we've helped them to increase the performance of the tool. And on the right hand side, you can see the dashboard after uh, performance optimizations uh, on the left without. Mm, and we all know that performance is important uh, because people can uh, get more insights at the same time uh, they spend with the dashboard. But that's not only this, they also spend more time with the tool. So they get even more insights within the same, uh, with, with, in, in, in the time they, they use the tool. Uh, we've learned that uh, after those changes, the average uh, session duration uh, doubled. Uh, so so I, I think that even those types of projects are important and we can collaborate uh, to, to improve that uh, work we do uh, on both sides. Uh, so this is our experience, this is our story. Uh, we uh, encourage everyone to collaborate with uh, people on the ground. We collaborate with NGOs, with uh, government administration, with academics, and this proved to be successful. Uh, we encourage you to uh, get in touch uh, with us if you think that uh, there is a space for, for us to collaborate. We also hope to uh, inspire uh, others to, to join this uh, growing global movement. Mm, and I hope this, uh, that, that, that our story is going to be useful uh, and maybe even inspiring to you all. Uh, I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Um... So I know that we have one question uh, already in the application. Uh, I will just uh, I will just I just want to mention that uh, you can ask the question uh, to Philip uh, through the application. The link to the application uh, Heidi posted uh, in the chat. So the actually we have two questions. Mm, so. Philip, uh, can you briefly tell us what you did to optimize the Epicenter Shiny apps? Do you have slides or documents on uh, performance uh, optimization? Mm, so, uh, I'm, I know that we, uh, th this might be actually a, the, the good question for uh, Jordan. I know that we have a blog post planned. Uh, I'm not sure if it's published already. We actually have a series of blog posts about improving Shiny applications from the very beginning, so just cleaning the data, to uh, the infrastructure level. So we have a series of four blog posts coming uh, in collaboration with our studio. So we'll send those to the organizers and hopefully get them out to you. Uh, so can you say uh, where exactly you can find the blog post? Because I'm not sure if this is uh, clear to everyone. Uh, they will go live on our studio's website. Um, and if there's an email list for this group, is there? Do we know? Uh, no, we are not collecting emails. Okay. But uh, maybe uh, we can... Uh, um, uh, we can share some materials on the through Twitter uh, mm -hmm. afterwards. Yeah, they're not live yet. They're going live uh, towards the end of this month, and they will go live both on our studio's blog and Absalon's blog. Okay. So, so to uh, at least give some answers here, uh, I know that uh, some part involved uh, replacing uh, uh, Dplyr, uh, which, which is highly useful, uh, but. Uh, uh, not always optimized for performance uh, with alternatives. Uh, so, so that was one. The other part was doing some work on the uh, JavaScript side instead of R. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's better to uh, pre-process the data uh, at the client side, uh, and that proved to be very useful as well. But that's, that's just a fraction. Uh, we, we also... Uh, Worked with uh, high chart uh, JS 
uh, implementation to, to improve its performance. Sadly, I was not technically involved. So this is only what I've learned after the project. Uh, the good part is that this project is actually open source as well. Uh, and it is on Epicenter uh, uh, GitHub. Uh, so you can actually go and see our, our uh, pull request and contribution. And uh, we can share this on Twitter as well. Thank you, Philip. And uh, we will do two more questions. Uh, so uh, please upvote the uh, questions you want me, uh, the last one that you want me to ask Philip, and the next one is, uh, how is your work uh, funded? So mostly self-funded. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we were successful enough to have enough of commercial work so that we can reinvest our profits uh, into doing this work. I must admit that getting grants is uh, very hard. We hope it is going to get easier with uh, our portfolio. Uh, but up to this point, we only were able to get money for cloud infrastructure, which is a lot as well. Uh, cloud infrastructure, if you train ML, is expensive. Uh, but uh, our time investment uh, is currently on us. Okay, uh, thank you. And the last one is how do you decide to work on a project with a local NGO in a given country? What are the criteria to start the collaboration? Uh, so, so we actually uh, want to uh, simplify the process. Uh, we uh, want to help people uh, potentially in batches, uh, different organizations. We, we see also a large need for uh, education and, and closing this gap of what's uh, possible, how to use the data, how to do some easy stuff with the data or the infrastructure that they have. Uh, so, so we don't have right now strict criteria uh, we strongly prefer projects that require help with R or Shiny, where we are experts, uh, or computer vision, uh, where we are exper experts as well. So, for example, if uh, for if right now uh, someone would ask us for help in NLP, we would of course look into the project and how we can help, uh, but it might be a longer process that with computer vision where we are able to build a POC within a day or two and, and know that we actually improved uh, the current uh, status quo. So two things, if I can add to that, um, whether it fits with our core mission, like what will be the positive impact of the project and then whether it fits our core competencies because we might not be the right people uh, for, for a given project. So mainly those two things. More questions? Olga? We lost Olga for a second. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, guys, I am back, but uh, my daughter actually uh, took the internet extender from the socket and I lost the connection. <laughs> Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry for that. Um, so, uh, Philip, did you manage to uh, hear the third question or, did some, or maybe someone uh, took over and read it? Yeah. So uh, let's move to uh, Martin. Uh, we can uh, continue with the rest of the questions during the discussion, but let's, uh, we are already a little bit off the schedule. So now Martin is uh, uh, your turn. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Marcin Dudersky. I'm a biologist, dendrologist from the Polish Academy of Scientists. I am an uh, environmentalist. Uh, 
from this uh, Venn diagram, we can see hacking skills, statistic skills, and uh, substantive uh, expertise. The most of environmentalists uh, are not good in data analysis, especially in data science, because as biologists, environmentalists, we are looking on the relationships between different parts of the total environment. Uh, you can see this uh, at the scheme here. There are a lot of components we need to look on the each relationships and we have to explain uh, every uh, pattern. For that reason, we have to uh, be more focused on the patterns, on the observations and explaining them and then, uh, then on the predictive power of our models. This is a limitation. Uh, not many biologists have uh, experience in data science. And I would like to show you some of our problems, some of uh, existing solutions which are adopting from the data science and what can we do to expand this. Our three, the most specific needs and problems are accounting for site specificity, uh, context dependence and local context. Uh, making a good generalization, but uh, this generalization cannot be injustice and uh, omit some groups. Another is more focus on the pattern explanation than on the uh, just predictive power of the models. And as naturalists, we also always have a problems with data. Too much data, too small data, or scarce data. Examples? We are talking now about era of uh, data in biogeography, biodiversity. There is a lot of data, much more than we are able to analyze, but mm, data are not uh, perfect. For example, uh, in the global databases of species occurrences, telling us where on the map the species is, we have a under representation of global south, most of observation comes from the global north. In global south, we have the most important and uh, most threatened species, uh, uh, global biodiversity hotspots. So this is one of the problems. But even when we look on the Europe, we can uh, mark a line of the better and uh, worse data coverage. Here you can see the occurrence records of English walnut, a very common tree species in Europe. And you can see that in Central and uh, Eastern Europe, there's not too much data. So we have no uh, clear presence absence data for analysis, but machine learning uh, provide us a, a good uh, tool. This is max and maximum entropy models, developed especially for presence only data, which is generating pseudo absences. And this is used for species distribution data. You would ask what this have common with the uh, climate change. For example, we can predict species distribution using the uh, climate data, which are available for the whole world, and predict which three species are the most threatened uh, in Europe. In our study, we showed that uh, Coniferous tree species, especially Norway spruce and uh, Scots pine, which are the base of forest management and wood production in Central Europe, are threatened. You can see this at the red color that in this area, in the next 50 years, these species will be in a not suitable climate, so will retreat. This is okay in Europe, but we have still a problem with uh, Global South, especially with species which are expansive, invasive. There are a lot of possibilities to uh, fill this gap. There's a lot of data in Google Street View, satellite images, uh, citizen science services like iNaturalist, or even YouTube can provide a good uh, data about species distribution. However, it is hard to dig this data. And here data science can help us get more valuable data, validate it, and prepare the better risk assessments and uh, plan for mitigation. Another problem is data processing. 
uh, we're always laughing that 80% of time is uh, data processing, 20% is uh, complaining for this. We often have a lot of data, which is uh, in fact not data, because uh, many observations are uh, describing one study plot. Uh, sometimes one data point uh, costs hours of days of uh, our work. And as we love spreadsheets, it's uh, hard to cope with this. For example, we would like to see carbon cycling because carbon dioxide from atmosphere is accumulated in the biomass. We can go to forest, take some simple measurements and uh, have a dimensions of forests to know how much carbon dioxide from atmosphere is accumulated in such forests, we need to cut some trees, drag them out, weigh them, and prepare a simple power equation showing the relationships between tree dimensions and uh, biomass, which uh, we can simply say that half of biomass is carbon stored in the biomass. Okay, eight trees, not too much, but to achieve a reliable country scale result, we had to cut 3,500 sample trees, weigh all of them, and this project took three years. 420 study plots, and in every study plot, uh, six separate spray trees because of data format. The solution of data science was diverse and markdown because the bureaucracy required from us uh, reports for each three months. Uh, filtering, uh, processing, conditional feed of particular models allowed us not to uh, die in the deep of the data and uh, data quality tracking. This is one of the results of the study. Uh, the models uh, showing how much carbon is accumulated in the uh, particular forest according to uh, particular forest dimensions. So we can use these models, apply to uh, forest data bank, which is for us big data, because it's uh, 3 million rows. It's uh, not big data in fact, but for us, this is amount of data which uh, requires from us a lot of patience. So we call this big data. How to expand the uh, application of these tools? We have now models. We cut a lot of trees to reach uh, the good models and uh, to know how much carbon we have in the forest. But we can match this with uh, ground level measurements, published data, uh, satellite images, forest inventory data to provide spatially explicit site specific models of forest growth and optimize forest management to maximize all ecosystem services, especially in preserve carbon accumulation, to know how much carbon is stored and what to do to not uh, release this carbon dioxide and to not uh, amplify the uh, climate change effects. What I say on the, at the beginning, revealing patterns. Uh, sometimes it is impossible with simple models and machine learning is a uh, very seducing uh, opportunity. However, uh, without explaining tools, this is uh, just a black box. So we cannot tell whether the model is correct or not, whether it falls uh, or no, because of logical assumptions. For example, we have a first inventory data from five mountain national parks in Poland. We would like to see what is more important, geomorphology, uh, climate, or forest characteristics, to forest biomass, to uh, particular tree species occurrence. We have a lot of noise in, in this data, and we also have site-specific patterns. So explaining this by simple models is uh, impossible. However, uh, fitting a good, for example, random forest model, allow us to derive patterns, but mere machine learning is not the good answer for us because we would like to see what is behind the black box. And 
we can uh, see how each of the predictors is working. We can use DALEX, a great uh, tool for explaining machine learning, to see how, assuming all other predictors at the constant level, the uh, predicted vari variable is uh, changing. So we can conclude about effect of particular uh, variable separately. You can see here the uh, website of the DALEX and its uh, philosophy. It's the tool which changed my, uh, my work and uh, my working life. Machine learning is helping also when we have unbalanced sample. This is a classic of our biological studies. For example, we would like to see what is the survival of this invasive species which is reaching more and more uh, habitats due to climate change. We were tracking fate of 5,600 seedlings uh, with uh, labels, uh, which you can see on the photo, by three years. We expected that maybe 10, maybe 20% will survive, but only 262 survived. Okay, this is a result, but it's not uh, enough. We would like to know why, but the sample is unbalanced. Most of the classificators uh, will be okay with the error rate of 4%, so we'll show no trends. However, there are a lot of uh, data science solutions. For example, a smooth algorithm which downsamples and upsamples uh, observations and allows for conclusive uh, predictions. Here you can see the example of patterns derived from so biased data, but leading to the biologically uh, reasonable uh, solution. Machine learning is good is a revolution however it requires from us uh, integrative approach as philip said the networking is very important uh, now we know that we have to uh, increase the range of variables which we are using social economic and environmental variables together can explain more and help us better project a uh, better world Another important uh, thing is data science education, which is uh, at the bad level. So we uh, have to put a lot of effort to understand uh, and be able to do uh, new technologies. Also, the important part is common language because the uh, gap between scientists, stakeholders, data scientists needs to be bridged and uh, the language of Daleks is uh, especially good because it overcomes problems with formal statistics, p-values and uh, other uh, formal things which uh, makes communication harder. Summing up uh, my presentation, my experiences of data scientists and environmentalists, data science provided us a lot of tools to solve our problems. Methodological advances um, bring new solutions and make some analysis which were uh, earlier impossible, uh, now possible. However, as we have no data science training and lack of time to know it all, we need to collaborate. The, our local meetings and conferences are the best place uh, for networking. I uh, personally learned a lot from uh, people from Poznan and Polish R uh, environments. So cooperation is more desired. We also need to stress that diversity of uh, minds brings productivity. This is not only biological relationships, but also it works in uh, data science because I learned the most from the geographers, climatologists, and mathematical statisticians uh, which works uh, in R, much more than uh, from biologists working in R. What can we do as data scientists? Support researchers needing help in your nearest vicinity, in your uh, environment, in your uh, local group. The platform for 
contact between data scientists who would like to uh, help and environmentalists needing help is especially needed. The good uh, thing which should uh, increase the collaboration is avoiding jargon and using easy language for both sides because uh, we have a problem with communications and the ideas of using data science in environmental studies which are connected with climate change are easy to take just ask uh, start and do something so i hope that we can go to the better better world uh, by collaboration between data science and environmental science thank you for your attention uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, let me check the, if there are any questions uh, for you. Um, so uh, we have two questions. Uh, how do you, uh, have you felt some resistance to purely predictive models from a scientific community, which is generally more interested in explanatory models? Yes, of course. Uh, in some papers, I had to more uh, develop the uh, hypothesis behind the variables used in the model. Uh, even in predicting uh, carbon mass accumulated in the forest, which is uh, obvious how the bigger tree, the more carbon. But uh, the reviewers uh, are very, very hard on this. Uh, also, in uh, other models using the landscape patterns, we had to uh, write more about how we uh, used machine learning. In three papers, I had to tell why I use uh, machine learning instead of uh, classical methods and why it is better. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, the last question. Oh, uh, okay, sorry. You said you use Daleks to interpret machine learning models. Is there any functionality missing that uh, would help you understand the models better? Hmm. For this time, Daleks is uh, fulfilling all of my desires and uh, it's now great too. I can't see the gap now, but I think that in the nearest year it will appear. Okay, um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, so uh, we, uh, we are uh, done with the presentation part and this is also the part uh, where we can uh, stop recording uh, and uh, move to the uh, discussion part.